इस कार्यक्रम का शुभारंभ करें हम आशा करते हैं आप स्वस्थ हैं सानंद हैं और इस बदलते परिवेश में अपनी सेहत का ध्यान रख रहे हैं आज के इस आयोजन का आनंद आप हमारे आभासी पटल फेसबुक और यूट्यूब पर भी उठा सकते हैं यह सर्वविदित है कि इंदिरा गांधी राष्ट्रीय कला केंद्र की कला निधि इकाई का ग्रंथालय अपनी सांस्कृतिक धरोहर की विशिष्टता लिए एवं अपने व्यक्तिगत संग्रहों के कारण असाधारण शोध संस्थान के रूप में जाना जाता है आज आप सभी की उपस्थिति से हम अभिभूत हैं आज के इस कार्यक्रम में जिन मनीषों की उपस्थिति एवं श्रवण करने का सौभाग्य हम सबको मिलने वाला है उनमें आज के हमारे मुख्य वक्ता भारत के प्रधानमंत्री की आर्थिक सलाहकार परिषद के सदस्य विद्वान श्री संजीव सन्याल जी सभागार में उपस्थित हैं मैं हृदय से उनका स्वागत करती हूं। साथ ही इंदिरा गांधी राष्ट्रीय कला केंद्र के विद्वान लेखक विचारक एवं चिंतक तेजस्वी व्यक्तित्व लिए सदस्य सचिव डॉक्टर सचिदानंद जोशी जी एवं कला निधि विभाग के अध्यक्ष प्रोफेसर रमेश चंद्र गौड़ जी जो राष्ट्रीय नाट्य विद्यालय के अतिरिक्त प्रभारी के निदेशक हैं आप सभी का स्वागत आपसे पुनः आग्रह करती हूं कि आप मंच पर अपना स्थान ग्रहण करें और साथ ही आदरणीय माँ शारदा आदरणीय कपिला जी को श्रद्धा सुमन अर्पित करें इसके साथ ही हम मंगल कामना करते हैं यह कार्यालय अपनी ऊंचाइयों और उत्तुंग शिखर को छुए समय है आज के हमारे मुख्य वक्ता सम्मानी श्री संजीव सन्याल जी के अभिनंदन करने का मैं इंदिरा गांधी राष्ट्रीय कला केंद्र के सदस्य सचिव डॉक्टर सचिदानंद जोशी जी से आग्रह करती हूं कि वह भाव प्रांजल वस्त्र और स्मृति चिन्ह से आपका स्वागत करें आभार आपका प्रणय डोर से बांधा है हमने बंधन या शुभ वाला आपसे गठबंधन करते हुए धन्य हुआ सभागार किस्मत वाला आभार आपका इंदिरा गांधी राष्ट्रीय कला केंद्र का ग्रंथालय 24 व्यक्तिगत संग्रहों से आलोकित हो रहा है जिसमें आदरणीय कपिला वासायन जी का व्यक्तिगत संग्रह अनेक शोधार्थियों के लिए मार्ग प्रशस्त कर रहा है अब मैं कला निधि विभाग के अध्यक्ष प्रोफेसर रमेश चंद्र गौर जी से आग्रह करती हूं कि सभागार में उपस्थित आप सभी का विधिवत स्वागत करें और आज के कार्यक्रम पर प्रकाश डालें आप सभी को मेरा सादर प्रणाम कलानिधि रेफरेंस लाइब्रेरी ऑफ इंदिरा गांधी नेशनल सेंटर फॉर द आर्ट्स इज अ वेरी यूनिक एंड वेरी हिस्टोरिकल library in the context that it has a, a very special program in form of preservation of personal collection of eminent scholars art historians or the eminent personalities who have contributed significantly in the nation building so as just uh, informed by my colleague we have about 24 personal collection of eminent scholar and this program was initiated by none other than dr kapila vasyan after 
leaving agency she herself donated her personal collection and uh, a collection of about 11000 books besides there are artifacts photographs and other archival material is housed in kalani the reference library and cultural archive of agency so to give our tributes and thanks our such donors we have started certain memorial lecture uh, beside this we have memorial lecture in the memory of acharya hazari prasad devedi we also have memorial lecture in memory of professor nambar singh uh, devin shrup ji and uh, others so as uh, we organized this lecture on the occasion of uh, birth anniversary of the eminent scholars 25th of december happened to be a holy day so we were not able to do it on that day so today uh, it indeed a great honor to extend a very hearty welcome to all of you in this third uh, dr kapila vashan memorial lecture which is going to be delivered by honorable uh, speaker today uh, sri sanjeev sonyal ji on bharat varsh a history of our civilizational identity so i begin with uh, welcoming our eminent guest with his uh, brief introduction uh, he is currently member of economic advisory council to the prime minister of india and he has served in various important positions a uh, principal economic advisor for 5 years to the finance minister till february 2022 and also the co-chair of the G20's G20's framework working group prior to joining the government he spent over two decades in financial markets and was global strategist and managing director at Deutsche Bank an alumnus of Sri uh, Sri Ram College of Commerce Delhi uh, he later attended Oxford University as a Rhodes scholar he was awarded the Eisenhower fellowship in 2007 for his work on urban dynamics and in 2010 he was named as a young global leader by the world economic forum in davos but above then uh, more importantly he is a prolific writer a very uh, well known speaker uh, some of his best selling uh, books include land of the seven rivers the ocean of churn india in the age of ideas and the indian indian renaissance so uh, we feel honored sir to welcome you and extend very hearty thanks to you that you agreed to grace this occasion the he will be truly supported by we have some special guest some vedic scholars uh, we have uh, sri k b krishnan renowned vedic scholar from chennai we have professor satisha k s head department of advait vedanta national sanskrit university tirupati and dr n bharadwaj sanskrit teacher and vedic scholar arsha vidyamandir chennai uh, we are grateful to them for sparing his, their valuable time and making uh, this a truly memorable event uh, this lecture is going to chair by our member secretary dr sachetan and joshi and we have uh, uh, usha ji from family and also uh, other family and friends of uh, dr kapila bashan i welcome you all honorable guest in this hall as well as who have joined at our youtube channel and facebook live with these words uh, i welcome you all thank you all and i invite you to connect with the ignca with kalandi the reference library with the treasure of more than uh, 5 lakh books 3 lakhs of digital manuscripts 45 personal collection of cultural archive of art historian and many other many more collections so i invite you to visit our library regularly thank you very much namaskar abhar shri आपने संजीव सन्याल जी का संक्षिप्त परिचय तो प्राप्त कर ही लिया है उसकी पुनरावृत्ति करने की आवश्यकता नहीं है मैं उन्हें मंच पर साधार आमंत्रित करूंगी 2010 में वर्ल्ड इकोनॉमिक फोरम की तरफ से यंग ग्लोबल लीडर के सम्मान से भी सम्मानित हैं आप तो इसके लिए तालियां तो बनती हैं 
मैं आपको मंच पर अपने वक्तव्य के लिए प्रस्तुत करती हूँ इसके साथ ही हमारा सौभाग्य है कि आज इस सभागार में एक विशिष्ट अतिथि और मनीषी उपस्थित हैं श्री के वी कृष्णन प्रख्यात वैदिक विद्वान चिन्नई प्रोफेसर सतीश शाह अद्वैत वेदांत विभाग के प्रमुख और डॉक्टर एन भारद्वाज संस्कृत शिक्षक मैं अनुरोध करती हूँ कि आप भी मंच पर आएँ Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen let me begin by thanking IGNCA for giving me this honor to deliver this year's Dr Kapila Vatsayan memorial lecture i know it's indeed an honor so let me thank especially Dr Gore and Dr Joshi for this honor and to all of you of course for uh, making it here on what is a fairly cold winter afternoon Uh, where i'm sure you're all being tempted to go out and sit in the sun the topic i chose for today is bharat varsha a history of our civilizational identity as all of you know this name bharat varsha or the land of the bharatas is the traditional name by which we indians call ourselves so the question is where did this name come from and how did our identity as bharatiya develop over thousands of years so this is the topic i have chosen for today and to help me i have three of india's top vedic scholars who have flown down very kindly to be able to provide authentic referencing of some of the things i will present so i will of course tell you exactly where i have taken all the uh my quotes and references from in the vedic puranic and other literature but they will be chanting it out for you some of you may be in fact sanskrit scholars in your own right so you may find it interesting but i just want you to be dead sure about the authenticity of what i'm going to say so that you can both see it and hear it for yourself now the question of indian identity as a civilization and a nation is something that has been actually not under debate only for the last 150 odd years and as you will see prior to that almost everybody took for granted that we indians had a clear sense of civilizational identity but not surprisingly during the colonial period a sort of story that was built up that somehow the indians never had a sense of themselves so you had for example john strachey the acting viceroy of india in 1872 saying that the force first and most essential thing to learn about india is that there is not and never was an india similarly winston churchill made a very famous comment india is a geographical term it is no more a united nation than the equator now i understand the why a colonial power that is occupying another country wants to spread the story that the, the country that they are occupying is not a nation and that in fact they are doing a favor by civilizing the natives of that country that they have occupied not a surprising at all that they should have this story but it is quite surprising that 75 years after independence you will still find indian scholars western scholars of course do this but even some indian scholars will come and make some statements to the effect that india is not a nation that it is merely a union of states and sometimes this even pops up in the political and other journalistic conversation so i want to show you where does this term bharatiya come from or by extension the term india and how ancient this identity is what is the basis of this identity and so on and so forth so let's start at the very very beginning where does this term bharata come from what is the very first and earliest use of the term bharata it turns out that this word bharata relates to 
a tribe mentioned in the Rig Veda. The tribe is also called the Trutsu tribe. It's a Vedic tribe. And this tribe lives as described in the Rig Veda. By the way, the Rig Veda is a Bronze Age document, which is at least 4,500, if not 5,000 years old. Um, so it is a very ancient document, or rather a composition. It's not quite a document since it was, um, it was orally transmitted for much of its uh, existence. But this compilation of the Rig Veda <coughs> mentions this tribe called the Bharatas who live along a river called the Saraswati. Incidentally, this river Saraswati is, very, is so associated with the name Bharata that is even known as Bharati. Even today when you do Saraswati Puja, very often you will end the puja by saying Bhagwati Bharati Devi Namaste. So this association of the Bharatas to the Saraswati Nadi is a very important one. And the Saraswati Nadi is a very critical geographical feature of the, of the Rig Veda. In fact, by some margin, it is the most important geographical feature. 45 of its hymns are dedicated to it. Its name appears 72 times. It's repeatedly lauded as limitless, unbroken, swift-flowing, as mother of rivers or Sindhu Mata. Remember the word Sindhu means a river, generically, not just of the Indus. And so it is clearly a very, very important geographical feature, and this tribe lives next to this river. Now, there has been, for a very long time, controversy over where this Saraswati River is. And colonial era historians would try to make the case that this river was either mythical or that it was somewhere in Central Asia, Afghanistan, and so on. But frankly, there is absolutely no reason for there to be any doubt about where it is, because the Rig Veda tells me where it is. There is something called the Nadi Stuti Suktam in the Rig Veda in Book 10. I've given you all the numbers, verse, etc., which clearly states that the, the Saraswati River is between the Yamuna and the Saraswati. So in this Nadi Stuti Suktam, all the rivers are enumerated from east to west one by one. It goes, O Ganga, Yamuna, Saraswati, Shutudru, which is the Sutlej, Parushni, Ravi, Ashkini, Chenab, and so on. So it is an enumeration of rivers east to west. And it is very, very clear here that the Saraswati is a river between the Yamuna and the Shutudru, i.e. the Sutlej. Now, I'm going to ask my colleagues here to chant the Nadi Stuti Suttam, so that you can hear it for yourself. Over to you. Om Imam Me Gange Yamune Saraswati Shutudristomam Sachata Parushnya Asiknya Marudhurde Vitastayarji Kiye Shranuhya Sushomaya Om So, first of all, it's clear it's between the Yamuna and the Sutlej. We have further information. The Rig Veda also tells it that this river flowed from the mountains, the Himalayas, to the ocean. And so there is a chant there says, pure is our course from the mountains to the ocean, alone of the streams Saraswati hath listened. So again, let me ask my colleagues to chant this section. Om Eka Achetat Saraswati Nadi Nam Shuchir Yati Giribhya Asa Mudrat Rayas Chetanti Bhuvanasya Pure Gritam Payoduduhe Nahushaya Om. So now we know we have a river that's between the Yamuna and the Sutlej, and it flows from the mountains in the north to the ocean. Now, there is no such river in existence today. So the question is, is there any evidence of such a river ever existing? 
And it turns out there is. So whether you take geographical, uh, you take satellite photographs or you do ground proofing, there is more than adequate evidence of such a river existing in exactly that place that is described in, in the Rig Veda and that it later dried up. And I will come to that drying up part a little later. But here it is. These are the, the green lines you can see. This is the course of the Saraswati River. It existed over a very long geological period, so its course did wander uh, significantly from time to time. So it has different courses, and yes, the original texts also mention that it was a bit of a wandering river. But if you look, it starts up with a bunch of tributaries flowing into it in the north. Then it comes together somewhere in Haryana, flows through northern Rajasthan into what is now Pakistan, flows back in into Gujarat and flows into its estuary, which is now the run of Kutch. If you go to the run of Kutch today, you see these salt flats. Well, they're the remnants of the estuary of the Saraswati. That is why it has this strange landscape, because once it dried up, it left behind this, the, the, the estuary of that river, which, which was obviously a mix of river water and salt water, so the salt was left behind. And so that is how you got your salt flats. Now, this river was a particularly important river in the pre-Ice Age period. It then dried up during the Ice Age and then revived about 10,000, 9 to 10,000 years ago. And all of this, by the way, is there in the geological records. And it ended up becoming a sizable river after it revived as a sizable river, although mostly as a rain-fed river, but still a very sizable river. But now many people think that a rain-fed river cannot be very large and powerful just because we have a mental image that everything has to be glacier uh, melt. It is not the case. Almost all the rivers in the world, including very large ones, are river-fed, like the Nile, Amazon, and so on. So there is perfectly possible to have very large rivers which are river-fed. And this river, Saraswati, was a very large river-fed uh, 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 rain-fed river in the post-Ice uh, Age period. And it flowed, as you can see, through all the lands that I had mentioned. And you can also see, very interestingly, there is a massive clustering of Harappan sites along it. It is very clear from the archaeology that the Harappan civilization was largely based along this river because there's such a large clustering of it. As you can see, there's far more clustering of Harappan sites along the dry riverbed of this river, which, by the way, now we know as the Ghaggar or the Hakra. And <clears throat> these cities, um, there are in fact far more cities along the, this riverbed of the Ghaggar than there are, in fact, along the Indus itself. And then they flow into the run of Kutch. And there are sites there to this day, for example, Dholavira, which look marooned in the middle of the run of Kutch. But in fact, in those times, were actually a port because they were in the estuary and there was water flowing and it was a port. So this was how it looked 3000 BC or 5000 years ago. So 3000 BC, this is what it looked like. And then starting around 2500 BC, that's about 4500 years ago, this river began to dry. And eventually, around about 2000 BC, it completely dried up. And there was a huge drought. And coinciding with it, this entire civilization collapsed. Now, it is quite interesting that the Vedas describe this civilization along the Saraswati. And there is such heavy evidence of, uh, large-scale evidence of a civilization existing uh, along this river in exactly the place you should expect it to be. Now, I'm not going to get into how exactly which archaeological site correlates to which uh, Vedic chant, because my purpose is slightly different. I'm going to now go back to the Bharatas. So here we have a tribe that lived along a river that we know existed. And in the Rig Veda, this tribe, the Bharatas, not only mentioned that they lived along this river Saraswati, they also mention the name of their homeland. And the name they call their homeland is the Saptasindhu. 
which is the land of the seven rivers. Now, a lot of scholars tend to say that, you know, looking around, where is this land of seven rivers? They very often will take the view that it is the Saraswati, the five rivers of Punjab, and the Sindhu. That, unfortunately, is not what is borne out by the text itself. If you look at the text, it's quite interesting that none of the rivers of Punjab or the Indus are ever mentioned as being a part of the seven rivers. What is mentioned, however, is that it has something to do with the Saraswati. So the Saraswati is always mentioned in the context of this river. In fact, you have again here a chant which says, coming together glorious, loudly roaring, Saraswati, mother of floods, Sindhu Mata, the seventh with copious milk, with fair streams, slow, strongly flowing, fully swelled with the volume of their waters. So it's very, very clear what you are dealing really with is the Saraswati and all the tributaries flowing into the Saraswati. In fact, it is with the coming together of all these rivers that the Saraswati is created, i.e. that Sapta Sindhu is created. In other words, you're dealing with a river system and a very limited river system. But before I come to that, let me ask my colleagues to chant this for you so that you can hear what it sounds like. Om Ayat Sakai Yashaso Vavashana Saraswati Saptathi Sindhu Mata Yasushvayanda Sudha Sudhara Abhisvena Payasa Pipyana Om. So now if we are dealing with only the Saraswati and its tributaries, and we have we know from the geological evidence that they were relatively small. I mean, in a very ancient times, it may have in, these tributaries may have included the Satlej and the Yamuna as well. But very likely, by the time the Rig Veda was composed, we are dealing with a relatively small area and, oh, and oh, of tributaries flowing into the Saraswati. Essentially, we were probably dealing with nothing much more than a small area, which is today called Haryana. Little bit of maybe northern Rajasthan, maybe a little bit of eastern Punjab, but basically we are dealing with Haryana. And this was the homeland of this tribe called the, the Bharatas. Now the question immediately arises that if we are dealing with a small Haryanavi tribe living in this very limited area, how is it that it came to signify the wider landscape of the subcontinent? And why do all of us, very few of us will probably be from Haryana, why do we call ourselves the Bharatas? In order to understand this, you need to move to understanding a major political event. But before that, let me again show you the importance of, Bharata, of uh, Haryana to this landscape. So in the Mahabharat, as many of you know, Balram, who was the elder brother of Sri Krishna, did not participate in the Kurukshetra war. Instead, he went on a pilgrimage and walked along the Saraswati from where it entered the sea near Gujarat and walked along what was by then mostly a dried riverbed. And he kept walking till he reached a place called Vinashana where the river was still flowing and were, but it was getting disappearing into the, into the sands. And then he says there that there are these three, there are these seven streams of Saraswati which flow into the Saraswati and combine together to create the Saraswati. And he mentions these seven streams in the Mahabharat book 9, Shalya Parva. And he these are named. This is the Suparva, the Kanchanakshi, Vishala, Manorama, Ughavati, Surenu, and Vimala, Vimalodaka. All these seven streams come together, join together at the Tirtha where Baldev came. And because the seven streams mingle together in the spot, therefore the Tirtha is known by the name of Sapta Saraswati. Now, it is very, very interesting that, again, this idea of the tributaries coming together to create the Saraswati River. And again, we do not know exactly where the location of all these are, but two things become clear. First of all, that these are not the five rivers of Punjab, which we saw earlier. They had names. These are not those names. Secondly, 
It tells you they all come together. But interestingly, they do mention that one of them, Ughavati, used to flow through Kurukshetra. So again, Haryana comes into the picture again. So again, I will request my colleagues to chant this particular section from the Mahabharat so they can hear it. Om Rajan Sapta Saraswatyaha Yabhir Vyaktamidam Jagate Ahuta Bhagavat Bhirhi Tatra Tatra Saraswati Suprabha Kanchanakshicha Vishala Manasahrata Saraswati Odhavati Suvenur Vimalodaka So again, I'm just establishing that we are dealing with a very small area. <clears throat> so now comes the interesting part, as I said. Why is it that this small area with this small tribe becomes so important that we all call ourselves the Bharatas? To understand this, you again need to go back to the Rig Veda and look at the first clear political event that we know of our history which is mentioned in the Rig Veda and is a clearly an important event in the Rig Veda, which is the Battle of Ten Kings. So let me explain what happens in the Battle of Ten Kings. In Battle of Ten Kings, what happens is that the Bharatas, who are then led by a chieftain called Sudasa and his guru Vashishtha, they are attacked from the west by an alliance of ten tribes. So when the tribes attack them, the Bharatas cross the Saraswati and they move westward and on the banks of the Ravi there is a great battle. And in that battle the Bharatas completely defeat the ten tribes. In fact, the Rig Veda clearly describes how the enemy soldiers are drowned trying to escape from the Bharatas in the Ravi river. And 6,666 um, uh, enemy soldiers are drowned in the, or killed in the battle. Now, given the population of that time, this was a quite a significant loss. And as a result of which, Sudasa and the Bharatas began, begin to create an empire. Again, let me ask my colleagues to chant out the description of the Battle of Ten Kings. Om Ayat Dasharaja Nasamita Ayaja was Sudha Samindra Varuna Nayu Yudhu Satya Rana Madmasada Mupas to their Deva Esha Mahavan Deva Hudishu Dasharagne Pariyataya Vishwata Sudasa Indra Varuna Vashikshatam Shvityan Choyatra Namasa Kapardino Dhyadhivanto Asapantatritsavaha Om Now with this victory, the Bharata Trutsu has become very powerful. They now turn eastward and they defeat another tribe or a chieftain called Bheda on the banks of the Yamuna. So now you have a large empire extending from Punjab in the west to western UP. And then chieftain Sudasa conducts the Rajasoya and Ashwamedha Yagyas and he declares himself the Chakravartin or the universal monarch. It's the first time in our history you have a universal monarch or what we would call an emperor. Now, is this why we call ourselves the Bharatas? No. It is about what they did next, and that is quite interesting. Having defeated all these tribes, you would have imagined that the Bharatas would now say that, look, our gods are bigger than your gods, therefore you must worship our gods. This is typically what ha happened throughout history when victorious meet the defeated. They said, our gods must be more powerful to have been able to defeat your gods. You must now accept our gods. But this is not what the Bharatas did. What they did is quite interesting. 
they asked all the thinkers and rishis and so on of all the defeated tribes and also of all surrounding tribes whom they may not have defeated, just happened to be in contact with them. And they called them all together and began to collect together all their knowledge and ideas and so on. And this compilation that they created out of all of this is what we now know as the Vedas. And this is an important thing because in doing so, they set in motion an idea of assimilation as opposed to imposition. And this is there very clearly laid out in the Rig Veda, which is again, as I said, the oldest of the Vedas, perhaps 5,000 years old. And here, <coughs> you hear this is very clearly delineated first in the first and then even more explicitly in the last of the hymns of the Rig Veda. So in the very first of the hymns of the Rig Veda, what is interesting, the, it is a chant dedicated to Agni. And in that chant, the first thing that is done is that respect is paid to both the ancient and the modern rishis. So this is very interesting. The Rig Veda does not claim to be the beginning point of our civilization in the sense that it is not in a sense saying that this is from here on we will do this. No, they are already paying respect to ancient rishis, in fact of all the tribes. And they are saying that we are inheritors of an existing uh, uh, system of uh, culture and we are as simply uh, 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 assimilating all of this, we are compiling all of this. The Vedas are a samhita, i.e. a compilation. And so again, let me ask my colleagues to chant out where they clearly pay respect to both the ancient and the modern rishis. By the way, the term modern, do remember, in this context relates to the Bronze Age. Om Agni Mele Purohitai Yajnasya Deva Mrtvijam Hotaram Ratnadhatamam Agni Purve Bhirrishi Bhiridyo Nutanai Ruta Sadevan so now they put all this material together and then all these tribes enter into a contract. What is this contract? Basically, sorry, I should have been flicking these charts along the way, which I wasn't. So they come to this common, they basically construct a common fire of Indic civilization in which they explicitly lay out that all the ancient gods of all the tribes have a place around the fire. In other words, all the gods of all the tribes have a place. And in doing so, they create the contract of Indian civilization, i.e. everybody's gods have a place and once have you, your gods have been accepted here, you are also expected to accept everybody else's gods. And so, the last chant of the Rig Veda goes as follows. Assemble together, let your minds be of one accord. As all the ancient gods take their rightful place around the fire, the place is common, common the assembly, common the mind, so be united, so their thoughts be united. A common purpose do I lay before you, and together we make offerings to the fire. United be your resolve, may all your minds come together, united be the thoughts of all that we may happily agree. So essentially, we are, this is the starting point with this contract of Bharatiya Sabhyata, i.e. our civilization. Now, again, this is a chant. Many of you may hear all the time, but now I want my colleagues to chant it so you now understand why it is such an important chant. It is the contract of Indic civilization. Over to you. Om Sam Samidyo vase vrishanagne vishwa nerya a ilas pades samidya se sanovasunya bara sam gachadvam sam vadadvam 
Now this idea of assimilation as a way of growth is a very powerful idea and it began to spread and more and more tribes who may have nothing to do with the original Bharatas accepted this idea and they signed up for it and therefore they ended up signing up to becoming Bharatiya or become Bharatas. So this is why I, I am a Bengali from the far east, nothing to do with Haryana. That is why I consider myself a Bharata, because a long time ago, my ancestors must have signed uh, this contract. They contributed their gods to this conversation. I don't know what they were. Since I am a Shakta today, let's presume that maybe it was Durga and Kali and, and various other goddesses who were then given a space around the sacrificial fire. And in exchange, they accepted the gods of others, Indra and Varuna and Ganesha and others. And so, in this way, this idea began to spread. And so, just as people began to identify themselves as the Bharatas, not just as the tribe, but now no, as an idea of a civilization, the idea of the seven rivers also began to spread. So, you heard originally the seven rivers. Remember the seven rivers and the idea of Saraswati and so on? That used to just relate to rivers in and around the northwest of India. Now look, by Puranic times, this is another 2000 years later, when the idea of the Sapta Sindhu has spread, in the post-Vedic texts, you see it covers the entire subcontinent and therefore, here is a very common uh, chant that is used in ritual bathing. Many of you may also know, use it in daily life perhaps. Gangecha, Yamunechaeva, Godavari, Saraswati, Narmada, Sindhu, Kaveri. You can see Kaveri and Godavari are there from southern India, Narmada from central India. So, there is clearly a spreading of this idea. And again, let me ask my colleagues to chant this. Om Gange Chaya Mune Chaiva Godavari Saraswati Narmade Sindhu Kaveri Jalesmin Sannidhim Kuru So, whenever you chant this, do remember what you are really doing. We are reiterating the contract. Now, along with this spread, by the Puranic period, and now you are into the Iron Age, you begin to see all the, the Puranic texts begin to clearly suggest the delineation of a knowledge of the uh, geography of the subcontinent of Bharatvarsha. So, by the Iron Age, we are now maybe 5600 BC, uh, maybe a little bit earlier as well, uh, and the texts begin to uh, show this. Now, very often the Vishnu Puran is quoted, so I deliberately didn't use it here. I've instead decided to use the Brahma Puran, adapted from Bibek Debroy's translation. Bibek Debroy is both a colleague, a mentor, and a friend who really has helped me put this together. Um, and here is in the Vishnu Puran. Uh, sorry, in the Brahma Puran, a clear, uh, clear delineation that the Varsha, i.e. The, the, the subcontinent, that is north of the ocean and south of the Himalayas, is known by the name Bharata. And the people there are known as Bharati. So clearly delineating where, where the subcontinent is. It also states that the Kiratas, i.e. the tibeto burmans live to the east of us, and the Yavanas, live to the west of us, i.e. the Greeks left, live to the west of us. This also dates this particular text, 
It's not always put in this way, but since in this case it says Yavanas lived to the west, this is interesting. That means the Brahma Puran, it must be from the 3rd or 2nd century BC, because this must be just after Macedo the Macedonian king Alexander had invaded northwest of India, and indeed the Seleucids were immediately to our west, because otherwise they would have mentioned the Persians or the Sakas or some other group. But this is clearly from the period when the Greeks were ruling just to the west of us, since the Yavanas, i.e. the Greeks, are mentioned. Again, let me ask my colleagues to chant this. Om Uttarena Samudrasya Himadresh Chaiva Dakshine Varsham Tad Bharatam Nama Bharati Yatra Sandatihi Yojananam Sahasram Cha Dvipoyam Dakshinotarate Purve Nirathas Tishthanti Paschime Yavanasthita So not only do you know exactly where it is, they of course describe the rivers. I have now already talked a lot about the rivers, so let me talk a little bit about mountains. So just like the rivers are described, so are the mountains. And you have here the seven mountain ranges within India. So of course the Himalayas in the north, the ocean to the south. Now these are the mountain ranges in the middle. Again the magical number seven comes up. So the seven mountain ranges, there's the Mahindra, which is the eastern ghats, the Malaya, which is the southern western ghats, which we know as the Nilgiris today. The Sahya or the Sahyadris, which is the northern western ghats. The Suktimat, which is probably the Aravalis, that's, that's my view. Riksha, which is the Satpuras, the Vindhyas, which is in those times was dealt with only the eastern Vindhyas, and the Pariyatra, which is the western Vindhyas. Uh, in case the people of <clears throat> the northeast are feeling left out, it also states that those who reside in the east are the inhabitants of Kama Rupa, which is Assam and the northeast in general. Again, let me ask uh, my colleagues to chant out this from the Brahma Purana. Om Mahendra Malaya Sakya Shuktiman Riksha Parvataha Vindhyascha Pariyatrascha Saptaite Pula Parvataha Purvadesha Dikashchaiva Kamaropanivasinaha Paunra Kalinga Magadha Dakshinatyascha Sarvasha Om Now, whenever I make this presentation at this point, somebody <clears throat> will come up and say, yes, but what about the Dravidians? So let me tell you a little bit about Tamil identity here. Now, Tamil identity is very much based on a collection of poetry called the Sangama literature, which was compiled between the 3rd century BC and the 3rd century AD. It's a wonderful collection of uh, poetry um, of all kinds. Uh, if you find translations, if you don't know Tamil, please read them. They are wonderful. I read them in, trans in translation, and they, they are indeed absolutely excellent. Now, in this Sangam literature, the very oldest <coughs> text is called the Tolkapiyam. It's a grammatical treatise, and it is literally the oldest Sangam text, dated to circa 2nd, 3rd century BC. And in it, there is a preface. And that preface is the has the oldest um, uh, sort of uh, articulation of Tamil identity that exists. So what I'm going to read to you is the oldest articulation of Tamil identity going back to the second century BC. And it says that in the virtuous Tamil speaking land that extends from Venkatam in the north to Kumari in the south. Now it's quite interesting because Kumari is Kanyakumari of course. And Venkatam is, of course, the Tirumala Hill, Tirupati. Now, this is just inside Andhra today. But if you use these as the markers, even today you could sort of mark out Tamil territory, Tamil Nadu, the state of today. So it's quite extraordinary that 2,300 years later, we can mark out Tamil Nadu using this description. So it is, a, it is 
quite remarkable. However, in exactly the same preface, just a few lines later, it, the text also states that in the wisdom of the four Vedas rooted. In other words, the oldest proclamation of Tamil identity clearly states that it is rooted in Vedic civilization. There is no way of getting around this. And I'm amazed that others have not pointed this out before. But again, as before, let me ask my colleagues here to chant out the section from the Tolkapiyam so that you can hear it for yourself. Over to you. Vada Vengadam Tin Kumari Ayidai Tamar Korum Nalvulahat Varakum Shayurum Ayurumudalin Yerutum Shulum Purum Nadi Shendamir Yerkai Shivani and Ilatod Mundunol Kand Murai Padayani Pulam to Hutone Pok Arupanuval Nilam Tarutirubin Pandian Avayate Arankarei Navin Nan Marai Kati Malgunir Varai Pin Aindiram Rainda Tulhapian Yenatan Payer To Tree Palpuhar Nirutta Padimayone. Now, we can do this with many other parts of the country as well. But let us remember that poor Haryana was not forgotten. It is remembered in even later as clearly the origin point. And so the land between the Saraswati and the Drashadvati is remembered, for example, in the Manusmriti as being the Brahmavarta or the region of Brahma, which is considered to be the land of the seers, of the rishis, or the origin point, so to speak. So even later on, Haryana is remembered. Incidentally, the word Haryana is not a modern word, like many people may take the impression. It too is actually means the land of the gods. Uh, it is also a very ancient word and certainly used uh, in the medieval times as well. Now comes the interesting part. Many of you will have heard that the name Bharat Varsha comes from the King Bharat. And you may be under the impression that this King Bharat was the son of Shakuntala and Dushyant. Actually, the more ancient texts do not mention this at all. This is a misconception partly due to Kalidasa. Um, there is an ancient story of a King Bharat who had conquered a large empire in the subcontinent called Bharat and came to be known as Bharat Varsha based on it. This story is sort of comes through in Mahabharat, for example. But this is not the son of Shakuntala and Dushyant, but an earlier King Bharat much, much earlier, that King Bharat is the grandson of a king, great king called Nabi and the son of a king called Rishabh. Incidentally, this is the Rishabh is also the founder of the Jain tradition. Now, this great King Bharat is said to have conquered the subcontinent, conducted the Chakravartin, uh, conducted the Rajasuya and Chak uh, Ashwamedha Yagya and declared himself the Chakravartin. Now, there is some problem here in the sense that how is this Raja Bharat linked to the Raja Sudasa that I mentioned earlier? Now, between the Mahabharat and the Rig Veda, there is a very vast difference, vast difference of time. Maybe as much as 2000 years have passed between the two. So, it is not very clear how the two are actually connected. But there are some parallels between the two. As I mentioned, both Sudas and Raja Bharat conducted the Ashwamedha Yagya. It is possible that the idea of this ancient King Bharat, who, by the way, by the time the Mahabharat was, writ, was being composed, was already thought of being very, very ancient. So it may be, it may be an echo of Raja Sudas, 
Very often kings are known by the names of their tribes. So it's possible that, Raj, that Raja Sudas came to be remembered as Bharat or, or the, as the king of the Bharata tribe. And maybe that is how this Raja Bharat uh, came to be. I do not know the answer to this. So I'll leave it to your discretion to decide this. But I did find something interesting I thought that I should re repeat that his grandfather Nabi had also conducted the Rajasuya uh, 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 Yajna and had declared himself a Chakravartin and that India has yet another name as Nabi Varsha. I would be very surprised if anybody in this audience knew this, that Bharat Varsha has another old, even older name as Nabi Varsha. Whatever way it is, this, whether it's Sudas, Nabhi, Raja Bharat, or subsequent emperors, one important thing remains constant, which is that having become the Chakravartin, the symbol of the Chakravartin is the spoked wheel, or the Chakra, which still appears incidentally on a national flag. It is not incidentally a Buddhist symbol as some people tend to point out to be, the Buddhists actually appropriated this because they wanted the Buddha to be seen as a Chakravartin or a universal monarch. But it is actually an older symbol and this symbol was then carried down by kings of subsequent times. Some were Buddhist, but it is also non-Buddhist uh, kings also would quite commonly use the Chakra as a symbol of the universal monarch. So the Chakra on our flag is consequently appropriate one. We also see, interestingly, the name of Saptasindhu now popping up in other parts of the world as well as they begin to think of us as a civilization. So it is quite interesting that till the colonial period when they began to question our sense of ourselves, nobody from outside had ever questioned the fact that we had an identity. And indeed, many of them had all kinds of names for us. So of course, we had the name, the earliest version of this comes through in the Western texts of the Zoroastrians from Iran or Persia. And it's quite interesting because these Western texts are actually composed in a language which is almost identical to Vedic Sanskrit. Indeed, these two languages are closer to each other than Rig Vedic is to classical Sanskrit or a Western is to later Persian. So they're almost identical except for a few phonetic changes. For example, the sound S becomes the sound H. This, by the way, happens even today in modern Assamese, as many of you will know. So then what happens as a result of this shift is that the land Sapta Sindhu becomes Hapta Hindu and the Saraswati becomes the Harakhwati. Incidentally, this is exactly how it's pronounced even today. Harakhwati is Assamese. But there is a dispute. These two groups of people are clearly from the same civilizational context because they use the same language. To this day, the Zoroastrians, i.e. the Parsis, still do a version of the Yajna using a fire sacrifice. But there is a dispute. The dispute is interesting <coughs> because the Zoroastrians worship Ahura, i.e. Asura. And later Hindus would come to worship the Devas and see the Asura as somehow demonic. But it is quite interesting that in the original Rig Vedic texts, this distinction does not exist. The Devas or Asuras are actually just two sets of gods, the gods and the anti-god, but there is no connotation of good and bad to them. This is more like yin and yang. So many of the gods of the Rig Veda, like for example, Rudra, Varuna, Mitra, and so on, are actually Asuras, and they are fully worshipped. And it is quite likely that one part of the ancient Rig Vedic contract was the acceptance of many of these Asuras, like Varuna, as part of the gods. But evidently, not everybody did. And some of the tribes clearly may have migrated westwards, or they were from the west anyway, and certainly we do know that one of the defeated 10 tribes was called the Parasas. So it's possible that the Parasas did not accept the contract and they continued to worship the Ahura, the Asuras, 
and maybe that is the source. But we do know that in the Zoroastrian tradition, the, the Devas are the bad guys and the Ahura, the Mazda or the great Asura is the great God. And you also similarly have here, they therefore lament that Hapta Hindu has now become too hot and people there of the beautiful Saraswati, they have all become corrupted because they are violating all the funerary rites by burying the dead or burning them. Now we know that the ancient Vedic people used to both bury their dead and to cremate them. Whereas the Zoroastrians would do neither and they would leave their dead out in the open. So there was obviously some sort of a dispute between these very closely related cousins which led to this schism. Nonetheless, they did pro provide to the Middle East the name Hapta Hindu from which the word Hindu is derived. Now many people tend to think that the name Hindu is just derived from Sindhu as in the river Sindhu. But in fact, the oldest reference actually comes from Hapta Hindu, which is from Sapta Sindhu, from where the word Hindu is derived. We also find this word Hindu then being used widely and there are many foreign descriptions coming from this. For example, that the Egyptians, know, know, ancient ellipse are known as Hinduvi, the medieval Arabs would call us Al-Hind. You have <clears throat> further out, this word becomes Ind. So you have the Greco-Roman Indioi, Megasthenes would call Indica. So you can see how the word Sindh becomes Hind becomes Ind. But if it goes the other way, similar changes happen. For example, the Chinese would know the Sindhu as Yuandu, Shintu, and so on. Al-Baruni's book on India, for example, again, this is now a lot, lot later, in the medieval period, describes the civilizational unity of the country despite its political division. So the point I'm making to you is that the civilizational unity of India was taken as a granted, not just in ancient times, but clearly by medieval times. And even he talks repeatedly about how these people have many common ideas and so on. It is also rather worrying how much he knew about the Indians because many people may not realize that he was actually a spy funded by no less than Mahmud of Ghazni. And in his book, he provides clear measurements of distances from Kanauj and from, incidentally, a sacred tree in Prayag, which, by the way, still exists if you go to Prayag. So these distances, as you can imagine, were something that, that were obviously uh, read with some interest back in Ghazni. Now, it's not just the ancient Indians or the medieval outsiders who understood that we had a civilizational unity. This idea comes back over and over again in later texts and other, other uh, traditions as well. And I'm going to just show you a few as, since, uh, just to give you an example of them. Here are the Shakti Pithas. As you all know, these are dedicated to worshiping the Devi in various forms. They are the body of Sati divided up across the country. Now, where does, what does this story that you, many of you already know signify? And to understand this, you have to go back again to the contract and see how, it's viol how Daksha violated it. You see, what happened is this. Sati's father, Daksha, held a Mahayagya, or a fire sacrifice, in which he invited all the rishis and all the gods, with one exception, which was Shiva. In doing so, he violated the Rig Vedic contract. Right? All the gods were supposed to be given a place around the fire, but Shiva, his son-in-law, is not being given a place around this fire. So Sati turns up, and she stops this yagya, and violates it with her own self by walking into the fire and burning herself to death. Now, this violation is a very serious thing. For Shiva himself turns up, lifts a body. And now, he is so angry that there is a fear that Shiva will destroy civilization as we know it. So, this violation of the contract is not some minor issue. The world can be destroyed by this violation of the contract. And Vishnu realizes what is happening. So, he cuts up a body and shatters it and he it gets shattered and thrown across the 
landscape that we, this holy landscape of India. And look at where it gets scattered. It's all over the country. It's not a random distribution. The easternmost Shakti Pita is in Tripura, Tripura Sundari. In fact, the state is named after Tripura Sundari. The westernmost is Hinglaj Mata in Balochistan. The northernmost is Sharda Mata, which is now, unfortunately, in Pakistan occupied Kashmir. And the southernmost is in Kanyakumari. And of course, all across the country, there are these, um, these there are the distribution of the Shakti Pitas. Of course, there's a concentration to the east, where from very ancient times there had been a, a concentration of Shakti worship anyway. But the point I'm making to you is the story of Sati is in a sense a reiteration that even in medieval times there were many who did not accept everybody's gods. And so therefore this reiteration of the ancient Rig Vedic contract had to be done over and over again. Incidentally, the same thing happens with the story of Holika and Prahalad. Prahalad, by the way, is an Asura. And what happens? He's not allowed to worship Vishnu. And again, the contract is violated. So you can see this contract violation and terrible consequences from it are repeated over and over again. So the, the idea of assimilation, of accepting of everybody's God is a very important one. But it requires that all those who contribute a God to this also accept everybody else's gods. Now the same idea showed up again of this sacred geography turns up in Shankaracharya's yatras. This is not a random distribution of his wanderings. This is clearly a map that you can draw out of this. And then he set, sets up four mutts. They're also not random. There's one in the north, there's one in the west, there's one in the east, and there's one in the south. It is again a particular geography that he is putting together. Puri, Sringeri, Dwarka, Badrinath. Four corners of the same geography. Now you may say, okay, maybe ancient times they had a clear sense of identity. Maybe in medieval times this identity was still alive. But what this, was this identity still alive at the beginning of the colonial period? And here again there is an example of how this identity was still very much alive. This is, I have deliberately chosen one from the southern tip of India, from Tamil Nadu, just so that, because this issue has come up before. This is called the Trichy Declaration of Marudu Pandyan from 1801. This was during the uprising of the Polygars, who were basically local chieftains against the East India Company. And their chief, Marudu Pandyan, made a declaration of independence in 1801, in which he says the following thing. He says, to all the castes and people, the Brahmins, the Kshatriyas, the Vaishyas, the Sudras, and the Musulman that are in the Jambudweep subcontinent of Jambudweepa, this notice is given. Notice that this is not addressed to a specific group of castes. It is also not to a people of a small region. So this is not about the people in and around Trichy or Tamil Nadu or southern India, or Dravidistan or anything. This is to the people of Jambudweepa. It's a larger landscape that he is dealing with, which is the landscape of Bharat Varsha. And you see that again, since I, same thing happening for people from the East. So Vivekananda starts out in 1890 to 92, and he wanders around India. It's again not a random distribution of places he visits. He travels all across Northern India, Western India, goes down to the South, and then ultimately, where does he go to ultimately come to this understanding of India? He goes to the southern tip of India, to Kanyagumari, to the rock. So again, you can see the same thing is repeated over and over again. A sacred geography is being reiterated. Now, this idea of Bharat, as you saw, is an ancient one. But it is not a static one. It is an evolving idea. It is not a pure idea as well. Along the way, it has assimilated many things. At certain point in time, it only meant a small area of Haryana. Later on, it came to mean a much wider landscape. In fact, at a particular point in time, 
in in the medieval period it may have would have also perhaps included southeast asia in it or parts of central asia in it as well so it's an ev evolving landscape it's not static it is also not pure in any way it has along the way accumulated all kinds of ideas some of them new ideas from within and many ideas with our foreign ideas as well so it is perfectly fine because it's an evolving fluid idea to accept these new and foreign contributions but it is very important at the same time that this acceptance of foreign ideas along the way does not extend to celebrating our own subjugation it is perfectly okay for us to accept foreign influences for example i am giving you this lecture in english this is not an indian language it came from the british who colonized us many of us enjoy a game of cricket or we may enjoy the beauty of the taj mahal which was constructed by a mongol prince came from central asia a dynasty that came from central asia it is perfectly okay for us to accept all these foreign influences because they are a part of this evolving bharatiya civilization but at the same time appreciating foreign contributions does not mean that we have to appreciate our own subjugation and celebrate it enjoying english breakfast does not mean that i love the Br british raj and this is important also to understand that this civilizational idea also extends beyond what may be modern indian republic to places for example like indonesia indonesia when it became independent in 1945 named itself indonesia acknowledging the civilizational link to india its national symbol is garuda vishnu's garuda its currency is the rupee the rupiya so this idea of civilization has spread beyond us as well but at this and so when the republic of india was formed the founders of the indian republic were very conscious that it was a modern manifestation of an ancient civilizational nation and so therefore when jawaharlal nehru in his speech at midnight on 15th of august 1947 you hear the speech what does he say it says the soul of a nation long suppressed finds utterance he does not say the soul of a union of states long suppressed finds utterance he clearly understands that this is an ancient civilizational nation which had gone through a period of suppression and it is now coming out and this also shows through in the very first line of the indian constitution it says india that is bharat shall be a union of states now why are both the words used in both laws dr b r ambedkar took the trouble of telling us this in a speech to the constituent assembly on the 4th of november 1948 because he knew that there would be some people who later on would debate this matter and he says though the country and the people may be divided into different states for convenience of administration the country is one integral whole its people are a single people living under a single imperium derived from a single source what is that source ancient indian civilization and the drafting committee thought that it is better to make it clear in the onset than to leave it to the speculation or dispute so i hope ladies and gentlemen you have been able to understand that the roots of our civilizational identity are very very deep indeed it's a civilization that is based on a very clear idea that is there in the last hymn of the rigveda it's an idea that has then spread both within india and then even beyond india it is an idea that remains alive today and it is an idea that today finds manifestation in the republic of india thank you very much ladies and gentlemen बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद अभी आपने भारतवर्ष हमारी सभ्यता की पहचान का इतिहास पर बहुत ही बेहद जानकारी हासिल की निसंदेह आप लाभान्वित हुए होंगे 
अब मैं कला निधि विभाग के अध्यक्ष प्रोफेसर रमेश चंद गौर जी से अनुरोध करती हूँ कि हमारे बीच उपस्थित हमारे विशिष्ट अतिथियों का सम्मान अंग वस्त्र और स्मृति चिन्ह से करें सर्वप्रथम मैं बुलाती हूँ प्रोफेसर सतीशा अद्वैत वेदांत विभाग के प्रमुख राष्ट्रीय संस्कृत विश्वविद्यालय तिरुपति से तालियों की गूंज से इनका स्वागत करें श्री के वी कृष्णन प्रख्यात वैदिक विद्वान चेन्नई डॉक्टर एन भारद्वाज संस्कृत शिक्षक और वैदिक विद्वान अर्श और वैदिक विद्या मंदिर चेन्नई से हमारे बीच उपस्थित हैं बहुत बहुत आभार आपका आज का आयोजन के अध्यक्ष अपने कर्तव्य की गुरुता को हृदय गम कर हमारी लौह श्रृंखलाओं के चिंतन को अपनी वाणी और अपने विनम्र व्यक्तित्व से मुंह बना देने की क्षमता रखते हैं निसंदेह इंद्र मैं जिनका जिक्र कर रही हूँ इंदिरा गांधी राष्ट्रीय कला केंद्र के सदस्य सचिव डॉक्टर सचिदानंद जोशी जी को मैं मंच पर आमंत्रित करती हूँ नमस्कार on the occasion of kapilavat sain memorial lecture today we had a, an excellent presentation by shri sanjeev sanyal bharat varsha history of our civilizational identity people who know shri sanjeev sanyal through his books might have read his books land of five rivers or the ocean churn where he has elaborated on these points quite substantially today when i was listening to his lecture i was reminded of uh, guru of uh, kapilavat sain ji shri vasudev sharan agrawal who has written a remarkable book on the unity of india in that book he has written a chapter known as desh ka naam karan how the name of india came into being where he refers to the instances of uh, mahabharat bhishma parv where uh, there are substantial evidences given for the justification of name bharat so that is how the emergence of india civilization is there we also remember manusmriti where people recite etat desha prasutasya sakasho agra janmana so people always want to have birth on this holy land that is the beauty of this country and when we know about india civilization we also remember that it was not only a geographical identity which was creating india it was a cultural identity which was spreading beyond the geographical borders of uh, the then india also so geographical india is one part and cultural india is another part today when we discuss about india's extension to different countries through its culture it is pertinent to remember and remind us that this was the civilization this was the culture which had its existence since the ages and that is what prevailed through the ages we had invaders who tried to demolish our uh, morale by pushing us back to the walls and giving discredit to our cultural ethos and philosophical identity but it was only the deep rooted civilizational existence which gave us strength to remain india as it is today and that is what has been elaborated in sanjeev sanyal ji's lecture at the ignca we have also made efforts to uh, study this from the dis different aspects because ignca uh, has 
a division known as Janpat Sampada under which we also do civilization studies. Uh, where we brought out a remarkable book known as Dvirupa Saraswati, where we have tried to give elaborate instances of Saraswati's Hindu civilization. And we have very strongly uh, said that we should, we should call it Saraswati civil, Sindhu civilization rather than calling it Harappan civilization only and limiting India's civilizational identity, which now is available in the state of Pakistan. Another remarkable book was written by Sri Mrigendra Vinod, known as Vinashana of Saraswati. That is, a, that is a book I think you must also try to uh, read, uh, which gives you elaborate examples uh, of uh, Vinashana, the word which you used in your fifth, third or fifth slide, I think. So the book titled Reclaiming the Lost Heritage, the Vinashana of Saraswati. So these are the two books which we have tried to, so we have published and we have tried to again establish India's civilizational identity and authority. Not only that, we are also trying to make efforts in deciphering the different seals uh, which was found during that time. And you would be surprised to know that there are scholars and who are not necessarily anthropologists and historians, but also oncologists and physicists and nanotechnologists who are trying to decipher the seals of Saraswati language, Saraswati age. Not only that, people are also interested in uh, tracking the route of Saraswati river. Uh, there are political instances which is being done in different states of bringing Saraswati into its existence by pouring water from some other resources and some other rivers. But that is a different aspect, but otherwise also there are genuine scholars who are making efforts in finding the roots of the Saraswati. And when you go to Mana and when you go to the place uh, where there is a flow which is known as Saraswati uh, and you see that flow and the way it comes from the mountain, you tend to believe on the story of Mahabharata. And we know why the Saraswati was sort of sent back on uh, when Vedavayasji was writing, uh, was dictating Mahabharata to Ganesha. So there is a Vyas Gupha and there is a Ganesh Gupha in the Mana uh, village. They are at a distance and I can, and person who goes there can imagine that there is a distance and somebody dictating must, uh, somebody trying to take the dictation must listen to that properly. And the Saraswati makes so much of noise there and ultimately, Vyasji got irritated and said, now you get lost. And you see, after a couple of meters, you don't see the Saraswati at all and it gets merged into another stream. That's, that's amazing geographical representation of that story, which is, which is being available in all its practical senses and beauty. So that is how our things also get validated. Maybe, it, it may be only a fairy tale, I will not say it is truth, but... When you go there and see everything, even, even uh, at a distance of 50 meters, you can't hear what your companion is saying. So much noise Saraswati stream is making at that place. So it's all very important to learn and listen. And I must thank Sanjeev Sanyalji for giving so much of her time and giving us an erudite lecture. We know whenever he speaks or writes, he does it with full authority compassion, commitment, plus it is a fact-based analysis and not a superficial uh, notion. And that is what is very important if we want to sort of bring out an India-centric narrative in the entire world, just to demolish the, uh, the thought which is being prevailed, especially by a group of Western Indologists. We should come together and fight it out with strong facts and um, figures. So I must thank, I must thank the audience who was very patient in listening to this lecture. And I must also compliment uh, the entire team of Kaladarshan Division for uh, making this event so successful. Thank you very much. Abhar Shri Aapka. 
मंचासीन सभी मनीषियों का हृदय से आभार व्यक्त करती हूँ और साथ ही आदरणीय कपिला व सैन जी के परिवार से उपस्थित आदरणीय सुभाष मलिक जी एवं उषा मलिक जी को हृदय से आभार व्यक्त करती हूँ आज के आयोजन की विचारधारा आप सभी सुधी प्रभुत्व जनों को अपनी भाव सुधा से अपलाबित करे यही हमारी शुभेच्छा है इसके साथ ही इंदिरा गांधी राष्ट्रीय कला केंद्र के सदस्य सचिव डॉक्टर सचिदानंद जोशी जी के कुशल मार्गदर्शन एवं अध्यक्ष सम्मान्य श्री राम बहादुर राय जी के गंभीर चिंतन से परिपूर्ण प्रेरणा के लिए मैं आभार व्यक्त करती हूँ इसके साथ ही प्रशासन एवं सेवा आपूर्ति विभाग मीडिया यूनिट कला निधि विभाग के सभी सहयोगी कर्मचारी जिनके प्रयासों से यह आयोजन सफलता के साथ संपन्न हो रहा है आप सभी का कोटि कोटि आभार चाय की चुस्कियों के संग मैं अक्सर अपने सारे गम डुबो देता हूँ चाय की चुस्कियों के संग मैं अक्सर अपने सारे गम डुबो देता हूँ मिठास कम है जिंदगी में मगर जिंदा दिली से जीता हूँ बेशक रोज पिलाती है तू नजरों से हाला मन की प्यास बुझाई कैसे सखी खाली है मेरे चाय का प्याला आओ बैठो मेरे साथ 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 चाय पीते हैं सर्द सर्द शाम को थोड़ा गरमाते हैं और चाय की चुस्कियों के संग इसे आजमाते हैं तो आप सभी चाय के लिए आमंत्रित हैं